Joan's going to bring our reading to us this morning. So, Joan. The reading is from Acts chapter 1, beginning at the first verse. Jesus taken up into heaven. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Joan, thank you for reading that passage from Acts chapter 1. The ascension of Jesus, what does it mean and what practical difference does it make, should it make to us as we live our everyday lives here on earth? What is the ascension of Jesus? When did it happen? What difference does it make to your everyday living, thinking, praying, behaving, relationships? We know that it is something that happened to Jesus after his resurrection and before the coming of the Holy Spirit, 10 days before Pentecost on Ascension Thursday. 40 days after Easter is when Jesus leaves his disciples here on earth and in his human body ascends up into the heavens to take his place at the Father's right hand. And Luke chapter 24 verses 50 to 53 tell us this, that when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands, he blessed them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. Acts chapter 1 verse 3 and 9 to 11 after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And after he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So the ascension marks the completion of Jesus' earthly work. And what was this earthly work? It was to come and provide a sacrifice for our sin, he being that sacrifice, so that people like you and me could be forgiven and enter into an eternal heavenly relationship through the doorway of the cross and through a relationship with Jesus as our Savior. John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. I have come to finish this work. And when he did finish the work in John 19, verse 30, he says this on the cross, it is finished. The work of providing the acceptable sacrifice is finished. The ascension says the work is finished. 
but there was still a resurrection. There were still 40 days of instruction. There was still the ascension. The ascension marks the ultimate end of the work that Jesus did on earth. I wonder, are you old enough to remember the celebrations of NASA control room when the Apollo 11 spacecraft came back from the moon and landed safely again on the earth? Job done, mission completed. What an amazing moment. And now the father receives his son Jesus back to glory after 33 years away. And what joy and celebration there must have been in heaven when the son returned back home. You know, in John 17, verse 5, Jesus prayed these very words. Father, give me back the glory I had with you before the world began. And that's exactly what he receives when he is back in glory. The ascension is the Father saying, I validate, I approve everything that my son did in his life on earth, his death and through his resurrection. And now he raised to my right hand on high. He is restored to his limitless intimacy with his Father. But he is restored with scars, the signs of suffering on this earth, on that cross that will remain with him forever. But what difference could it make to us as people who love and follow Jesus in an increasingly hostile world. Well, the first thing is if Jesus is taken up through the clouds in his resurrected body, he is going to a real place called heaven. It is not a mirth or a crutch. Heaven is a real place for real people. So Jesus tells us in John chapter 14, verses one and six, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And here's Thomas again asking questions. But it's one question I am so pleased he really did ask, because... If he hadn't have, how would you and I have known the way? And this is what Jesus said. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through a relationship with me. So Jesus tells us that heaven is a real place where he is going and where he is going to prepare for us who love and who follow him. You know, some people laugh at Christians. They think heaven is just a crutch for poor Christians to hang on to, pie in the sky when you die. But Jesus tells us plainly that heaven is for real. Look at what he says. They're his words. He said, first of all, trust him. Number two, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So trust God. Trust me. So how much can you trust him? How reliable, how authentic do you consider this Jesus to be and these words and this promise of heaven that he makes to us? Verse 2, my father has many rooms. My father owns this amazing house, this incredible house, and there's piles of room. It's a family home. My father is a welcoming father, and he is giving you a loving invitation to anyone, to everyone who repents of their past, puts trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord of their lives. And he says, there's room for you, lots of room. Verses two and three, I'm heading on in front of you to prepare a place for you. He says that he'll come and meet us. He'll be at death's door. He'll lead us into life, aliveness, joy, and the freedom that is in the Father's presence. A life that we've never, ever experienced in this broken, dysfunctional world that we live in. You know, there's something built into every one of our DNA. There's something inside me and you that doesn't want to die, that wants to go on living forever. And that is a good desire that God has put within the heart of every person that we want to live and we want to go on living forever. And because of Jesus and because of what he accomplished 2,000 years ago on that cross, through the resurrection, ascending into heaven, we need no longer fear death, but we believe in this place that the best is yet to come. Maybe you have doubts, maybe you have questions, maybe you have hurts, maybe you have fears. You might say, Arthur, this whole idea of heaven is a bit of a crutch. Life beyond this life, I'm not sure. 
Well, again, look at that incident of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, verse 55 to 56, when he is being stoned to death. And it says, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, he looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen, the first martyr, sees Jesus standing at God's right hand in heaven, a real visible place. It's like putting on 3D glasses. You see a different dimension that is there all along. Folks, there is truth here. When we believe in heaven, we are believing in a real place, a real world, and not some crutch for emotionally weak people. Heaven is real. Jesus is there. When Jesus leaves earth on that day, right in front of the very eyes of those disciples, and he ascends into heaven through that cloud, he is welcomed, he is enthroned, he is adored, he is celebrated as the undisputed, all-conquering, totally triumphant, risen, glorious, victorious king and conqueror of all his enemies, especially our great enemy Satan, who causes such heartache and heartbreak to us as God's people here on earth. So folks, the story of the ascension is the story of our Saviour Jesus, who is the glorious, victorious, totally undisputed conqueror and King of heaven and earth. And in the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, we see that he has been raised from the deepest depths of death and hell to the highest heights of heaven, far, far above all the other powers or forces, human or spiritual, above all human rulers, even above Satan's demons, for the sake of us, his church family here on earth. So that when we are struggling here on earth, when we as Christians are suffering with all kinds of terrible persecutions, attacks, trouble and trials, when it's hard that we can hardly pray because we're so weak and we feel that maybe we can't go on any longer, we know that when we pray to God and we come to our Lord Jesus, that there is no higher power, no more powerful person or force in the universe than Jesus, and that our God does whatever he pleases. No powers on earth or hell can stop God from doing what he wants to do in answer to his people's prayers. Psalm 115 verse 3, our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. If we really grasp that, believe that, experience that, how might that help followers of Jesus who are really struggling, broken, hurting, under severe persecution, lost everything simply because they are Christians? If God could open our spiritual eyes, just as he opened the eyes of Stephen to see the spiritual realities of our risen, reigning, glorious Jesus enthroned in heaven and over the earth, we would not feel so defeated and deflated as Christians at times. We would not let our heads drop in defeat, even though it looks like we are totally surrounded on every side by godless forces of secularism, universalism, materialism, and atheism, which erodes our convictions and confidence in the mighty power of our God today, our risen exalted King Jesus is not one bit threatened by this godless world we live in today. Yes, there is a battle, a battle that is intensifying all around the world. And yes, it is going to cost more to follow Jesus and live counterculture lives. And yes, we will have more struggles, battles, pain, heartache if we truly follow Jesus. But that is no bad thing if we can see the mighty power of the risen, ascended, exalted King Jesus, just as Stephen had his eyes opened. We need to ask God to open our eyes to see Jesus as he really is right now, the King of heaven and earth. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. If our eyes were really open, what would that do for us? How would that change things for us? What things would change? What difference would it make? Well, 
It would totally change our perspective on our troubles here on earth. It would give us a new God-given confidence, boldness, conviction, joy in the middle of those troubles. And our prayers as individuals would be radically transformed. We would be passionate, believing, expectant in our praying, and we would not have to live in a downward spiral of defeat and despair as Christian believers or even as a church. Sure, there is a battle. Sure, there are discouragements. Sure, Satan is at work sniping and snapping away at our heels. But we are people of the exalted Jesus, and Satan is trembling before Jesus. If Jesus is King of Heaven, seated at the Father's right hand, He is all-powerful. He is interceding for us, His Church, on the battlefields of earth. That Jesus is constantly carrying our prayers, our cries, our tears into the Father's presence in love. And the Father is listening to his precious son, Jesus. Jesus knows, he sees, he feels our struggles here on earth. And because he has lived here and has felt all our struggles and much more, he identifies with our pain as we try to choose him and follow him in this world. Hebrews 9 verse 24, for Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. The promise is that one day all his enemies will be fully and finally defeated and done away with, and the conflict will be over. Jesus will put all his enemies under his feet. Two, Jesus will return to this world, and everyone will see Everyone will recognize, everyone will acknowledge, and everyone will bow before him as the true and living and victorious Lord and King. And thirdly, we will one day rule and reign with him, sharing in his authority over the nations at his right hand, just as he sits at his Father's right hand. What an incredible future, folks, for the children of God. What an incredible future for a child of God. I want you to join me as we affirm that faith as I use the words of the Apostles' Creed. So let's do that with conviction in our hearts. I believe in God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.